so the Flinter competition is in full swing by now. For those of you that didn't know, there is a competition running in the Hunter Classic in which you can win this bow right here for taking first place. And the competition is basically the total score of your highest scoring Blacktail, Mule Deer, and Whitetail Deer combined. By the time this video comes out, there will still be about two and a half days left, 10 attempts, so plenty of time to get in there and participate. And I really want to see if we can get the best community participation in this competition, because I really think what EW has done here by incorporating creators into this event is fantastic. And if they want to do it again in the future, I want them to see that we appreciate what they're doing. So in this video, we're going to go for a little hunt, hunt for all three of those species and talk about tips and tricks, strategies, tactics, field judging, all that stuff. And just to be clear, it is not going to be do this and you'll win, but hopefully some tips that can help you out. So let's first talk about strategy. And when I say strategy, I basically mean approach to the competition, how we're going to kind of like choose which maps to hunt. And we're starting here on Red Feather Falls. My personal opinion is that Timbergold Trails is so good from Mule Deer that we're going to want to focus mainly on either Red Feather Falls or Whiteheart Island. Both of those maps have Whitetail and Blacktail Deer. And probably the best move is to try to get a decent Whitetail and Blacktail from there I would be putting six or seven attempts on those maps and then the remaining three or four attempts over on Timbergold Trails. Now, I'll draw out the path that I plan to take for this hunt and it's already going to get screwed up because there's a decent whitetail track I want to follow. But essentially, we're going to walk up on this little loop here, move down into the swampy area, and basically everything down in here is all whitetail territory. As we get about to this point, we're going to start to get into a little bit of blacktail territory. We're going to move all the way up basically to the northwest corner. You can see I've got some tents and stuff up here through this island and up onto here. It's going to take a long time to do that, but it's going to get us through a lot of deer territory and it should allow us to see a good number of whitetail and blacktail. Now, as I mentioned, there's a pretty heavy whitetail track that's actually going the other way, so that's already going to throw us off, but anytime you get a chance, especially at a decent whitetail track, to go and follow it and maybe run into a good one, it's worth kind of deviating from the path. Unfortunately, that decent weight buck is not all that impressive, but I think we might take him with a gun. We're kind of getting closed in on by a moose and a doe, and I'd rather just make sure we get him down. So the two bucks we've shot so far definitely are not going to be ideal for a competition score, but I did want to talk about a little bit of field judging. So obviously, this is not what we're looking for in a whitetail buck. I would guess for a competition like this, you probably want at least a 180, maybe a 190. I have seen, and when I'm recording this, the competition's only been open for about eight hours. There's some pretty good entries already, so I think to place in this competition, you'll need a pretty good whitetail. What you're looking for in a whitetail buck is, first of all, an 8x8. If you're shooting a buck that has 16 total typical points, you're probably looking at at least a 170, and if you can find one with long, even tines, and fairly massive tines, then you're looking at a really good one. I have my 200 on screen here, which is about as big as they get, but the angle doesn't show the eight times really well. So we also have a 187 here that we can see a little bit better is a clean eight by eight. So that's what you want to kind of look for in whitetail. And if you can bring a bow like we did with the first one, that is obviously ideal. Sometimes like in this case of the second one, you want to use a gun. If it's a big one, absolutely use a gun. Any weapon is allowed for this competition. So long as it's ethical for the deer that you're shooting. But bows are definitely going to help you out if you have access to one. Now that is a little more like what we're looking for, but I believe this is a 7x7 and he's got this little kicker over here. Now, I'm sure most of you know this, but any abnormal tine, as they call them, will be a deduction. So that's ideally not something we want to see, but this is definitely a decent buck and probably going to go, I would say, low 160s. So we're going to try to take that out as we continue moving north. And good to kind of get an example of at least a kind of better one. Tine length is decent, frame is solid, it's just that he doesn't have that eighth tine on either side. That's gonna work to drop him in his tracks. And we kind of get to see too, like, why a bow can be so useful. This doe that was coming in basically has no idea anything happened, so should that have been another buck or even just the doe there? Rather than spooking it and it running and maybe spooking another buck in the distance, we can just take it out and nothing back in the direction that we're trying to go in has any idea anything happened. But just a quick look to kind of give you an idea of at least generally what you want to look for for whitetail, this or bigger is basically the idea, like really nice time length on that, 
just needed that additional Titan other side to really help it out. 165 is a solid buck for sure, but like I said, I think for Whitetail, you'll probably want something a little bit bigger. So as we kind of get further north here, we start to get into Blacktail territory, and unlike Whitetail, Blacktail will travel in groups. Now in this case, I'm only seeing one very unimpressive buck and one doe. I'm guessing there may be others around, but that's a really important thing to remember specifically with Blacktail. If you see one buck, and especially if you see a buck and a couple of does, be sure to wait, call them in, make sure there's not a bigger buck in the background. Now of course, it is also possible for Blacktail to travel solo. Both males and females can do that. And I'm actually thinking in this case, that's what's happening. We just so happen to have a solo buck and solo doe kind of side by side. And, you know, as I said, we're into Blacktail territory. It's not a huge surprise for that to happen. I think we spined that guy, so luckily we're not going to have to drag him. Now, for the competition's sake, we would probably want one about 150 inches bigger than this. That was a spine shot. Yeah, that's a 41 score. Now, the interesting thing with Blacktail, and we'll look at field judging, hopefully we can find another buck, but they have a kind of scoring oddity. You can get pretty regular scoring from all the way down at like around 20 up to 160. From there, you'll rarely get 170s or 180s. It's either 160s or 190s. 190, of course, is the score you want for this competition, and I'll try to talk about the difference, but it's sort of subtle. So we are slightly moving in the right direction. This buck goes 110 to 130 on the estimate, and you can see by these animations he's actually spooked. So in this case, we will go with the gun just to try to take him out, and then we'll talk a little bit about field judging for Blacktail, because as I said, the difference between a 160, which is a slightly above average buck, and a 190, which is what you're going for, is not that big. Both are going to be Pretty impressive 5x5s. Smaller brow tines, but otherwise, long beams, long tines, pretty big forks. But the biggest thing is, I've got a 160 on screen right now, and you kind of can see the size of the frame, and of course, perspective and everything is going to play into this. But when we put the 190 on screen, compare it to the character model, it's so much wider set. The beams are longer, the tines are a little bit longer. It's just basically a scaled up version of that 160 rack. And it can be really tough to judge if you don't have high, like, spotting skills. But I think once you've hunted Blacktail a little bit, and especially if you've been actively hunting Blacktail, you typically can kind of make that distinction. Now, if you see a really big Blacktail, like 196, 197, about as big as they get, the tines almost get boxy. It's going to sound weird, but I'll put a 196 on screen and you can kind of see what I mean. There's just kind of a boxier shape to everything going on here. It's a little bit more than even the, I think, 193 that we had on screen prior. Is those little nuances that make the difference in scoring? But I really wanted to show that. If you're out there and you're looking at several big bucks and you don't know what specific thing to look for, hopefully this can help you in making the right decision as to which deer you want to follow, track, take out, whatever it may be. Now, when it comes to Timbergold Trails and Mule Deer, it's a little bit different. I don't know that I can really like draw out one particular path on the map because there's so many good areas, but kind of like Blacktail, Mule Deer will travel in herds, but rather than being some does and some bucks, it's going to be herds of all bucks. Now, I think somewhere in here was a Mule Deer doe. Just so happens there's a solo doe. That's her right there. Now, as for a decent Mule Deer, it just so happens at the very back of this group, there's one decent buck coming in. Kind of like Blacktail, a big 5x5 is what you're looking for. Smaller brow tines again. This is going to be like a 190. Mule Deer go all the way up into the 240s. So, similar way, same basic frame, way scaled up. And we'll take a look at that as this guy gets closer. And actually what we might do, because there's a long line of deer coming here and he's at the very back. We might just go ahead and take him with a gun. But I'll show you where we're at. I do find this to be a really good place. Smaller lake down here in the southwest. You see we've kind of traveled across a decent amount of area. There's been some mule deer, but I was waiting for a herd of bucks to talk about this. Because it really can't help you. You hear one grunt, decent chance you're looking at potentially up to five bucks. Now, it could be a solo buck, but pretty often they do travel in groups. So let's go ahead and try to take this guy. That'll work. And we'll go over there and take a look and try to talk about field judging. Because when you do 
fairly often have herds of five bucks, you may get several big ones. And again, making the decision, making the right decision as to which buck you want to take is pretty key. And for this one, we'll probably need to go into trophy shot mode just to actually see it, because we did kind of shoot him in the water, but that's a 177 score. For like the bigger frame, that's about as low scoring as they'll get. But we'll kind of just stand him up here. He does have a little sticker that would take away from his score, but the main things we're looking at are the deductions. These shorter times in the back, that's taken away from the score. The main beams aren't nearly as long as you want. Let's compare this to a really high scoring Goldier Buck, a 242. The biggest thing you'll notice, for one, the, the frame scaled up. It's wider set, times a little bit longer. But look at the difference in main beam length. Look at the difference in the length of the tines at the back in the forks. Much longer tines, way longer main beams. And again, just a general larger size frame. That's what's contributing to the extra 70 inches from this 177 to the 242. And that's essentially what you're trying to look for. Those are some of the easier things to spot when it comes to mule deer. They can be pretty tough to judge. You can still get a lot of decent mule deer bucks that look similar, kind of like blacktail, that still just score maybe 200 or 210. That difference between a 210 with a perfect frame, long beams and stuff, and a 240, it takes a trained eye to see it, but even a 210's a decent buck for this comp. Not doing too bad on the mule deer front though, there's a 210 to 240. Pretty solid, so this will give us a perfect opportunity to try to compare. We're going to go ahead and call him in, and just because there's a giant there, doesn't necessarily mean he's the biggest one of the group. We should at least try to call and see if they'll come in, at least give us a chance to spot all five, because we're looking at four right now. I do not see a fifth buck, but they'll pretty much always travel in groups of fives if they're going to be in a group. I do think he might have slightly short times in the back, and that's going to cost him a little bit. Little, like, minute things, but you see how this time isn't quite as long as this one? Now, it matches, so it's not a deduction per se, but it's also not some extra time that could be there. And I do think, again, we're probably going to go ahead and go with a gun. I still don't see a fifth buck coming out of here, but I don't want him to walk basically past where we can see. The other bucks are way out ahead of them. They're likely to get close and spook. We're better off just taking him out. He does have one short main beam, so before we shoot him, this left side, the main beam wraps all the way around. The right side, it's short, so I'm guessing 220s, 227, something like that. But we will quickly see. One thing is for sure, though, like, this main beam is pretty good. That one down there, considerably shorter, and that will be a fairly major deduction. Ended up with a long shot. That is going to be a score of 216, actually. A little lower than I was thinking. Maybe not quite as big a frame as he initially looked like, but still a solid buck. One I would certainly be happy to take at any stage. And as far as what we're looking at for reasons he's not scoring higher, obviously these tines are a huge difference. I'm actually going to go into this just to be able to use the mouse. These could be considerably longer. There's probably between the two tines, four to six inches that we're missing out on there. This is the big one, though. This beam is five inches shorter probably than this one so we're potentially missing about 10 there and then we're right around that area of 230 if all these tines match which of course they don't but little things like that are things to look for if you see you know a frame of this size the main beams are long like the one on the left and they match the back tines match you're looking at something pretty special for what it is though not too bad and more likely than not when you're mule deer hunting. Something will be there as a deduction, whether it is like the main beams not matching, the short back tines. Finding a really big one is extremely rare. Of course, that's the entire point of the game. The real trophy animals are so hard to come by, but I think I'm going to go ahead and do the math and figure out what place we'd be in with this two and a half hour hunt. And again, things will change by the time this video would be out. But the last thing I want to talk about is basically where to expect to encounter mule deer and Again, they're pretty all over Timbergold trails, but we'll at least look at maybe the hot spots. Now, keep in mind, the competition has only been open for a little under 12 hours, so the scores over the course of the next several days are only going to go up. But in our two and a half plus hour hunt here, we'd currently be in second place. And that's just a result of going through areas where we expect to see the deer species we're targeting. We've seen a lot of deer and for each species, we found at least a decent one. And we fast traveled to one last spot that I absolutely would want to hit if I were competing in this competition. And that's basically 
this little stand I have set up here next to the river system. So we'll open up the map just down here, like basically at the end of the big lake where it runs into the river. I find it to be a really, really good spot. I've shot a lot of big mule deer here in the past and almost always, if you fast travel here later into a hunt, especially, there's going to be some bucks around. And if you don't have a tent set up here, it's absolutely fine. You can still wander down through here and expect similar results. Now, unfortunately, the bucks that we have coming in are pathetic. This might be the smallest mule deer buck I've ever seen. We definitely have to shoot that. And then there's this one, the one that grunted. Not so impressive either, but ultimately what you're doing in hunting a spot like this or any hotspot. And the thing about the Hunter Classic is hotspots are only so effective because the animals do just free wander around the map. But there are areas where you pretty consistently run into animals. And if this is a spot where there's optimal mule deer bucks, one of these times you're going to run into a big one. So really quickly, I have to know what this thing scores before we go and talk about the main hotspots I like here on Timbergold. I think my smallest mule deer ever is 24. That's a 24.0. So we're going to trophy shot that super quick. And I mean, at this point, it's just indisputable facts. The flinter bow guarantees big males like this, but let's talk about the hotspots. I've got three main ones and a few others that we'll talk about. So first of all, the tenth of rat right now, just to kind of show the general area on the map, right down in here, I find it to be really good, especially later in hunts. Down here, right at the Y in the river is where we shot our 216. I always find that to be good. And then this tent is where we shot our first decent buck, the 177. This lake also is really good. So I'm going to clear all that. We'll also just clear our path so we can see a little bit better what's going on. I find all of this area up in here to be pretty decent. And there are mule deer like on this mountain too. It's just a little tougher to hunt. The entire river, generally all the way up in the north, can have mule deer and on either side. And there's plenty like down through here. There's a lot in the south. Frankly, there's just mule deer all around the map. And that's why I said it's really tough to just like draw a path to go on because they're everywhere. And I find it's best on Timbergold to kind of let the deer dictate the hunt. If you're hunting around, you get a grunt, you find a track, follow it, let that take you where it may. So I think on that note, that's going to do it for this video. I wanted to just kind of go through, at least on a basic level, some tips, tricks, tactics that would maybe help you out with this competition. I really hope if you're, you know, really wanting to participate, this stuff can help you out. Feel free to leave any questions in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer all those. Best of luck to everybody out there. And once again, I really want to see if we can get the best participation in this event. So if you're interested in Classic, if you want to participate in this comp, absolutely go for it. I'd love to see what we can do as far as that as a community. But anyway, that's going to do it for this video. So as always, thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you next time.